This morning, I was running really, really late, as I often do on a Sunday. I had a million things going through my mind. And so I showered and I got dressed and I was trying to put some makeup on really, really quickly because it's, it's not really my thing. Like I, I'm just a slap and go kind of girl. I'm not an artistic kind of, you know. And so I was running really, really late this morning and so I was putting it on. And I felt like I was putting on like war paint. It was just, you know. And God was like, you're in a battle. And I was like, but God, I love these people. Like, I don't want to battle with them. And I think if God could roll his eyes, he'd roll his eyes at me. And it's like, you're not in a battle against them. You're in a battle with the enemy. And so I had my war paint on this morning. And I really felt that... We need to pray before I speak because I have a feeling that the enemy, well, in fact, the enemy's always after us, right? He's always on, on the prowl like a lion. And I really feel this morning that he wants to take the words that I'm going to share with you and he wants to twist them and turn them for his purposes and not God's. And that is never, ever God's intention. So I'm going to open in prayer. Father, I thank you that you have prepared us for warfare and for battle. Father, I thank you that your words that you speak to us, your words in your book are always truth. And so, Father, this morning I pray against the lies of the enemy that would come and tell us otherwise. I pray against the enemy that would come to steal your truth and distort it with his lies about how things should be. Father, this morning we commit everything we do to you. Father, in all my words, may I honor you. May I always give you the glory. And I ask that you would soften people's hearts to bypass my words, but hear your word that you have for them this morning, Lord. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So my message this morning is entitled, Money Mobilizes Missions. Now, I know that that's an awful word. You know, when anyone up the front uses the M word, well, that's the thing. I've used three M words, so I'm like stepping out there, okay? But when anyone uses the money word in church, people tend to put their heads down. They tend to avoid eye contact, and their body positions can actually tell you a lot about the way people think. So, yeah, I know. Everyone just... (laughs) Just relax. It's okay. It's okay. We can get through this. The reason I know this is because when I first became a Christian, I thought that all the church wanted was my money. And I used to get so upset. And I used to sit there with my arms folded, scowling, and thinking, it's it's all about the money, you know? And to be honest, some weeks I would even avoid church when I knew that they were going to be speaking about the M word. And God, and you know, he's so gracious and he's gently taught me that it's actually not a bad thing. Okay, it's actually a good thing. And so this morning, I don't actually want to talk about money. So now you can just unfold those arms and you can relax, okay? But the thing is, this month we are talking about missions. And if we're going to be really honest, missions requires money. Like we do it in faith and there's a huge faith component to this, but we can't do what we do without money. And so I am going to be speaking on missions this morning, but to get your eyes off money... I'm going to use chocolate, okay? Because everybody loves chocolate, and it's way more, less threatening than money, okay? But just know that when I'm talking about chocolate. Yeah. And I do just have to say that these are my favorite chocolate bars, so, yeah, I can do this, right? One of the greatest examples that we can see, here it is, in the Bible about generosity 
and giving is in 2 Corinthians. And it's the Macedonians, the churches of Macedonia. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes a letter of encouragement to the Corinthians about the generosity of the Macedonian churches. Because the Jewish Christians back in that time, back in Jerusalem, had fallen into poverty due to a famine and really high taxes from the Romans. And so Paul went round raising money from the churches that he'd started to help them out. In 1 Corinthians 16, he wrote to all of the churches and he gave them guidelines about how they should save their money for this big offering that he was going to be taking up. All of the churches agreed that they would send a relief gift as a symbol of their unity in Christ to help these Christians that were really struggling. Many of the churches were thrilled to give, but the Corinthians didn't actually save up for this gift. And a year down the track, when Paul was writing to them, they didn't have the money for the offering. So even though they were excited at first and they agreed on this, their excitement had died off and they were not feeling very generous. So Paul writes to them to encourage them to once again be a generous group of people. And he uses the Macedonian churches as an example. Paul's writing this letter was to not tell off the Corinthians, but to try and bring out the best in them. And that's what I'm hoping to do as well this morning. So we're going to pick it up. If you have your Bibles or your devices from 2 Corinthians 8, and we're going to be reading verses 1 to 5. My Bible um, entitles it Generosity Encouraged. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. And then a little bit further on and down in verse 8, it says, I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. In his letter, Paul writes about the churches in Macedonia, Philippi, Thessalonica, and Beria, and that they had all given, and they had given generously, even though they were really poor, and they had given way more than Paul expected that they would. And so this morning, in context with our missions and with our faith cards that we got handed out last week, I want to take a look and see what we can learn from the Macedonian churches who not only gave, but they gave generously and they gave with joy. As Vanessa shared this morning in communion, which was beautiful, thank you, I was holding back the tears, she mentioned four things that Christ did. She mentioned that there was passion in what he did, that there was faith, that there was sacrifice, and there was submission. Christ did all those things at the cross for us. And this morning I want to take a look at how we can look at those examples and what we can learn through the Macedonians about those four things. So the first thing that we're going to look at this morning is that missions giving requires passion. We see in verse 2 that out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up and rich generosity. Despite everything that they were going through, they found it in their hearts to give, and to not only give, but to overflow with generosity. There was a passion in them that even their circumstances could not put a damper on. And so after reading this this week and spending a bit of time on it, I started asking myself a whole lot of questions. What, if anything, Am I passionate about? Am I excitable about what God is doing? Do I look to the future and hope with anticipation at where God can use me with missions? Do I look for ways where I can be generous? 
Or do I look at my circumstances and think, it's too hard, I can't do anything? Or do I look at it as the Macedonians did and give regardless? You know, I would love it if people from the outside looked in at North End Church and went, man, what a generous church. Like if they, looked in, they, they could look in and see that despite what some of us are going through, that we are a generous and a passionate people who serve our God. And so this morning, are you filled with rich generosity when asked to support the work of those in need? Or is your first reaction when we talk, talk about money, Ugh. is there a passion for what God could do through you? Is there a passion inside of you for those who don't yet know him? Maybe there's an area in your life that you need to ask God to help with. Maybe you need just a wee adjustment in your attitude to be as passionate as the Macedonians were about giving. Now, I know that we can't answer all these questions this morning, but we do need to have a level of passion within us for the lost. There needs to be a level of passion and compassion that will well up inside of us and make us step out of our circumstances and do something to be generous. Now, this is going to look different for each one of us. Some of us will be called to go overseas. Some of us will be called to serve locally. But regardless, all of us are called. And all of us are called to be generous. And so this morning, if you're sitting here and you know that you're lacking passion when it comes to missions, I challenge you to ask God, to change your heart. Ask him to break your heart for what breaks his. Ask him to help you take your eyes off the money side of things, to not get fixated on how much and and how much and, and when you can do it, but to instead think of having a heart filled of generosity. The Macedonian giving was done with passion and it was done with joy. In fact, their giving was done with an abundance of joy. They were begging earnestly for the favour of taking part in the relief of those Christians who were in need. It was from their relationship with God that they were able to give beyond their means. In spite of their affliction and in spite of their extreme poverty, these were a generous people. My prayer is that our church can be like them. And so if we were going to use my chocolate here, an example of giving passionately, because I'm going to give it away. (laughs) I am. Maybe. If I was going to give this chocolate away, like if I had no passion, I'd be like, want some? You can have it. I don't care. Or do you go, look, I've got chocolate and it's awesome and it's just, Yum! Have some! Seriously, have some! Like, honestly, which would people rather have? Passion? Yes! Because no passion is just boring, right? I mean, they still get chocolate, but it's just like, ugh. So let's, let's give with passion. Okay. The second part of what they did is that they gave with sacrifice. Now, I know this is another uh, word to be using because sacrifice means giving something up for a greater cause. It means us. It means you giving up something for a greater cause. And, you know, here in little old New Zealand, we're kind of comfortable, right? I mean, we have a few struggles and we have issues. I mean, everyone's got issues, but generally, we're pretty comfortable. And if I was going to be really honest, I would say that most of us don't know what real sacrifice is. I mean, I think it's admirable to give up, you know, a cup of coffee a week and, and donate that money. That's, that's awesome. Do that. But if you really think about it, is that true sacrifice? Maybe you need to give up two coffees a week. I don't know. Just saying. 
<laughs> yeah, Jamie, you've just done it, done it for the cause, given up coffee, love it. But the thing that I've learned is that the greater the sacrifice, the greater the reward. Verse 3 says, For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. The Macedonians didn't just go, well, I've got 20 shekels, so they can have four. They understood that it was not about how much they gave. It was not about giving begrudgingly or being guilt-tripped into it. But it was all about giving out of their dedication to Christ, which then compelled their love for fellow believers. They knew that it was a good and the right thing to do, and they didn't use the excuse of being poor as a reason not to give. They knew what it was like to be poor, and so they used that as a motivation in their giving. And what I love about Paul writing to them is that he didn't... He, he, sorry. When Paul wrote to them, he knew that they were poor, but he wrote to them anyway because he wanted to give them the joy of giving that he knew it would bring them. Generosity comes from a heart that wants to give. The Macedonians did not give because they had so much excess and they just wanted to get rid of it all. Rather, they gave in spite of their severe affliction that they were going through and in spite of the extreme poverty that they had. What they did was real sacrifice. Generosity never happens if we first evaluate what we have. And actually, giving should not be limited to what we currently do have. If we look for excess in our lives, we will never, ever give. We always think that we need every single dollar we get. But the Macedonians showed us otherwise. They showed us that we can sacrificially give and still be okay. Their giving was love exemplified. In 1 John 3, 16 to 18, it tells us, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can we show them the love of God? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This kind of sacrificial giving can only come when individuals give themselves fully to God first. This is not about money, but it's about how right our heart is with God. True Christian generosity can't be measured by how much one has to give, because I found that often those who have less actually give more. True Christian generosity is sacrificial, and sacrificial giving is God-enabled. We shouldn't just wait till we're in a good place before we give, but we should be like the Macedonians, and we should be ready at any time to give what we have in our hand, and maybe even give a little bit more than that. Maybe we can look beyond ourselves and give above and beyond. God's love should always compel us to those in need, even if we're in need ourselves. And so if I was going to look at my chocolates sacrificially, wouldn't be, would it? So if I was going to give away my chocolate sacrificially, it means giving it. Right? Smiling. Giving it all. You know, even if I felt like a Kit Kat in half an hour, it's okay. Hey? I know, right? Giving sacrificially means that we don't think of our own comfort, but we give our lives to God and see what he wants to do with our Kit Kats. The third part of giving with missions is that it requires faith. 
Verse 4 tells us that they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the saints, even though they were poor. Missions is a demonstration of God's love and his truth, and it's an invitation into partnership with him. But it requires faith. When something requires faith, it means that we need to lean in on God. It means that we need to trust him and not rely on our own strength. You know, Phil and I learned years ago that missions is a faith commitment, not a I can do it commitment. If you gave an amount every month that you knew that you could afford, if you knew it wasn't going to be a stretch, then technically it's not a faith commitment, is it? No. You don't need God for that. You can do that on your own. And so it's not sacrificial and it's not giving in faith. And the thing is, God wants to partner with us. He wants to work with us so that we not only bless other people, but that we learn to grow in our relationship with him and trust him even more. He wants our faith to grow. So this morning, where do your faith level sit? Do you believe for amazing things from God? Or are you happy to believe just for enough? With nothing extra for you or anyone else. You know, Phil and I have so many incredible, incredible stories of when we took that small step of faith and God met us there. You know, I've got story after story in my journal, and I could stand here for hours and tell you about some of the faith journeys that we've been on. And it's really, really great to look back on those, and it's great to be reminded of those things. But I'm actually, I want new faith stories. You know, I can't live off those things from 10 years ago. I want to be stretched in faith. No, really, I do. I want fresh revelation. And I can't wait to stand here this time next year and tell you what God did when we took that step of faith. You know, life is not meant to be boring. And I can guarantee you that if you take a faith journey with God, it'll be anything but. And I also just want to say at this stage that Phil and I are taking a huge faith step in this as well. You know, just because we're the leaders here doesn't mean that we get to sit back and go, well, go them. You know, we are in this boots and all. And so we are praying about it at the moment, about what God wants to give and how he wants to stretch us in that beautiful, uncomfortable way. And I'm really, really excited to see what God does, not only in our own personal family, but in our church family as well. What is impossible for man is God's realm of participation. Because the fact is, God doesn't actually need us. He could actually do this all himself, but he chooses to partner with us so that we can experience his divine touch and so that we can get to know him at a way deeper level as we learn to trust him more. And so we partner with him in faith. Giving is not limited by what we have. It is only limited by our faith levels. And so with my chocolates that I so happily gave, you know, am I believing in faith for more? You know I am. I am believing for an abundance of chocolate because that's how faithful my God is. I have a big faith for Kit Kats. Yes. The fourth thing that our missions requires of us is submission. Again, I'm just picking all those fun words, aren't I? (sighs) Something we're not comfortable with in the Western world, I think. But in verse 5, it tells us that they did, they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. When we're facing hard times, or even just in survival mode, the last thing we tend to think about is how we can help others. But the Macedonians, even though they were poor, submitted themselves to the love and the direction of God. They didn't think first about their own needs, but they thought about his will. 
And because of their great submission, God gave them a special grace to accomplish this act of amazing generosity. This was not about money. This was about submission. They trusted God for their abundance in giving, and they trusted him to supply their own needs as well. You know, if we look at the Bible, giving is both a command and a privilege. We serve a God who is big enough to supply all of our needs, and one who promises us that if we sow on good soil, we will always reap more than we sow. And you can read that promise in Matthew 13, 8. May we never be so distracted by our own needs and so caught up in our own wee world that we lose sight of his great power to provide, not only for us, but through us. Submission is more than just good intentions. The Macedonian churches had more than just good intentions. They followed through and actually gave. The Corinthian church may have intended to give. They may have thought about giving. They may even have been favorable to the idea. But until they did, it was worthless. Scottish scholar William Barclay says, the tragedy of life is not that we have no high impulses, but that we fail to turn them into actions. We say that we love the Lord and his work, but are we prepared to show it by how we live and what we give? Not only in money and Kit Kats, but in time and talents as well. Are we willing to submit our will to the Lord's and let him lead us on a faith journey, whatever that may look like? I was reading an article this week and it challenged me way beyond my comfort zone. And in it, they quoted an American philosopher called Michael Novak, who says that we have three different measures of belief in our lives. The first belief is the public belief, and that's what we want everyone else to think that we believe. The second belief is our private belief, and that's what we think we believe. And then there's a third belief, and that's true belief, and that is what is revealed in our actions. Does our belief that God will provide actually line up with our actions? Do we think that he will Sorry, do we think that he will, yet our actions would say otherwise? Our actions show the convictions of our deepest selves. And so just as I was challenged, I want to challenge you guys. And I want you to ask yourself, you know, what conclusions can be drawn about, about my, sorry, what conclusions can be drawn about my beliefs from the way that I act? Am I being obedient or am I just full of good intentions? You know, people can't see my good intentions or my nice thoughts, but they can see my actions. And so is my life a good illustration of what a Christian should be? If I never follow through with the things God has placed on my heart, how will people know what I truly believe? Good intentions never change the world. James 2, 18 says, Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. What message about God will people see in your life? Will they see a generous, loving God, or will they see a God who talks a lot but does little? My point here is not to make public what we give to missions, because that is completely, completely between you and God. But the point is, are you being submissive in what God is asking you to do? Are you listening to his voice? Or are you just hearing those bits that you want to hear? Are you picking and choosing what you listen to? Just because giving is done in private doesn't doesn't mean you can't get away with it. Are you submitting to what he's asking you to do? God is extravagantly generous And we honour him when we surrender to him in obedience and submission. True giving, like the Macedonians, is to the Lord first. The Macedonians' love for God was their strongest motivator, and it should be ours as well. And so with my abundance of chocolate, 
am I going to be generous? Because really, if I look at my hands, I've probably got enough for me to keep some and still be generous, right? But if that's not what God's saying to me, if God is saying, I need to walk faster, if God is saying that I need to be generous and sacrificial, yeah, I'm getting there, (laughs) then really I need to take what's from behind my back and also give all of it, right? Even this melted one that was on the speaker. Because if we're being submissive to God, we're doing what he puts on our heart, and that means giving all of it, if he says, give all of it. I know that faith journeys can often be a little scary. In fact, most of the time they're a lot scary. But I also know that it is stretching, and it grows us. And it helps us become closer to God. And that is what it's all about. And so as you look at your faith cards today, I want you to look at them with these four things that we learned from the Macedonians and that we learned from Jesus when Vanessa gave the communion message. The first is that we need passion. The second is that we need to sacrifice. The third thing is that we need faith. And the fourth thing is we need to be obedient and submissive to what God is calling us to do. And so as a church, we're not all about taking your money. What we really want for you is for you to give yourselves and give your lives to God. When you fully give your life in every area of it to the Lord, generosity will overflow. When we grasp that our lives are not our own, then we will also see that our wealth and our possessions are also not our own. Living a life that honours God and completely trusts and follows him will change how we look at money and how we look at our possessions. Exodus 19 tells us that the earth and all that is within it is the Lord's, and that includes all the Kit Kats. We see generosity as a grace of God and a virtue that we are to excel in. Therefore, we will give in spite of our circumstances. We will give with joy, proving our love for the Lord. Generosity does not come from how much you have. Generosity comes from a sacrificial heart and from an obedience to his will.